All right. Good evening, everyone. Uh, we'll get everyone seated here and uh, just want to welcome, welcome folks to uh, our event this evening, our forum. Uh, so this is the, uh, well, first of all, I'm Lucas Frerix, member of the Davis City Council. Uh, I am a member uh, of a, a group called Saving California Communities that actually uh, we formed during the uh, Great Recession, uh, sort of about 10 years ago now, back in 2009. And, uh, and it is a group of YOLO community members who have joined forces to advocate for uh, adequate and effective resources for our communities. And that was really, it was pretty basic at the time, but our communities, whether it was <clears throat> the city, the city, not just the city of Davis, but cities, cities, counties, schools throughout the state uh, were it, it feeling the uh, dire effects of the Great Recession uh, when uh, and staffing levels were being, you know, uh, slashed, uh, the not enough resources to actually cover city and county and schools budgets and such. So we uh, were at the time found just, wow, that's not good. We, sorry about that. Don't know that. I'm not sure that that was me. <laughs> so might be an omen of a uh, time has passed or something. Okay. You want me to do the, uh, Okay, let me, I'm gonna switch to this, hand, this mic, wireless mic. Great, okay, so <clears throat> we'll see if that, uh, we can avoid that uh, loud noise uh, again. Uh, so as I was just saying, uh, Saving California Communities was founded about 10 years ago as a group of citizens that was uh, just engaged in trying to make sure that there were adequate resources for our communities and, and really help sort of uh, make some uh, you know, progress at the state level in, the, in terms of the legislature uh, as well in terms of advocating for fiscal reform uh, and, and again, of course, adequate resources uh, for, and funding for our, for our various uh, local governments here in Yolo County. Um, so we are really happy to have you all here this evening. I think we have a great program for you. Uh, the, our, the title of tonight's event is Shaping California's Future, and it's a f public forum on redistricting and the redistricting process. Uh, you know, I mentioned a little bit about our history. <clears throat> Would just say a couple of a, a couple of key folks that are here with us this evening who will also participate. But Susan Lovenberg, a longtime Davis School Board member, and um, uh, who also works for California Forward. Uh, Don Saylor, Supervisor Don Saylor, also founding member. Uh, a number of other folks who are here: Jan Agee, Shui Chang. Uh, who else is our some of our? Oh, Davis Campbell, of course, and Bob Agee up here in the front as well. All co-founders of um, the Saving California Communities group. I wanted to just also quickly thank a, a couple of our partners this evening. Firstly, the City of Davis, appreciate the city's support of this event. Uh, also, Davis Media Access is here this evening, always a great, our, our community media center uh, here as a partner with us, uh, recording this uh, event for to be used in the future and played back on Davis Community Television in the future. Uh, and then also California Forward uh, is a partner. Uh, California Forward, most folks know, is a nonpartisan and nonprofit organization, a statewide organization that imp devoted to improving the performance of government throughout California. So uh, appreciate all of the support from our partners as well. Uh, and then I just want to do a quick introduction of our panel, uh, and then we'll get, we'll get going. Um, and really, I think the, the 2020 redistricting process is something that we really uh, are, I think, there are a lot of questions about, there's a lot of excitement about, and there are really ways to get involved in the process as well. So um, with us this evening, um, we have four panelists. Uh, the first is Public Policy Institute of California Research Fellow Eric McGee, and he's going to be talking about how the 2010 cycle of citizens redistricting affected elections. Uh, Nicholas Heidorn, uh, Director of Redistricting for Common Cause California, speaking regarding voter suppression and gerrymandered districts and efforts underway to extend citizens redistricting um, to county supervisorial districts throughout the state. Margarita Fernandez um, is the Chief of Public Affairs for the California Audit State Auditor's Office, which has responsibility for conducting uh, outreach to ensure uh, widest possible applicant pool, as well as facilitating the form formation of the 14-member uh, Citizens Redistricting Commission. And then the chair of uh, the last speaker will be a chair of our of the 2010 Citizens Redistricting Commission throughout the state, and former, uh, Yo certainly Yolo County resident, but former uh, Davis City Council member and school board member, um, Stan Forbes, is with us as well, speaking to the importance of applying to serve on the commission. 
Uh, and so with that, uh, we're going to have each member is going to have uh, approximately 15 minutes uh, to speak, and then we will have an opportunity for uh, questions and answers at the end. And so first up is actually um, Nicholas Heidorn and on the gerrymandering topic. Thanks so much. Oh, do you want this one or do you want that? Thank you. Thank you to, um, for everyone for having me, and thank you all for being here. My name is Nicholas Heidorn, as was mentioned. I'm the director of the California Local Redistricting Project, which is a joint effort of Common Cause and McGeorge School of Law. And I'm also the legislative advocate for California Common Cause, which is uh, the capacity that I'm here in today. For those who don't know, Common Cause is a nonpartisan, nonprofit, good government organization. We advocate for election, campaign finance, and voting reform. And in fact, redistricting is something that our organization has worked on since the 1970s. Uh, and it's particularly fitting to be talking to you here about California's redistricting because it's possibly, it is actually the most successful state when it comes to reforming the process. So what I'd like to talk to you about today is kind of set the table a little bit. What is redistricting? What is its importance? And why did California move away from having politicians draw lines to our independent commission process and why that's important? So first, I want to start with a basic overview of, of what is redistricting. As many of you probably know, redistricting is the once per decade process where election district boundaries are modified so that they have about equal population. We tend to think of redistricting as applying just to state legislature and Congress. It certainly applies there. But redistricting actually applies wherever you have election districts at any level of government. So if your city council is divided into council districts, they need to redistrict as well every 10 years. Same with your county board of supervisors. Redistricting is particularly important uh, because we need to ensure that everyone has about equal representation in government. So redistricting is actually mainly done so that if one district has a big growth in population, another district has a drop in population, the size of those districts, the amount of people in them would get really uneven over time if we never change the districts. So every 10 years we bring the districts, we force those lines to be changed so that you have equal sizes. You have kind of the, the principle of one person, one vote is being brought together through the redistricting process. Uh, but of course, in, in, in kind of explaining this, I like to think of what did we do before redistricting? Because actually we have a little bit of a test case. It, until the 1960s, there wasn't a requirement for state legislatures to redistrict. So what did that look like to give you a sense of the discrepancies that could happen? It used to be that Los Angeles County, with its six million people, got one state senator, and three rural counties in California, with only 14,000 people, also got one state senator. So when you think about it, you had six million people represented by one person, and you had 14,000 people represented by one person. So proportionally, one person's vote was worth 450 times more if you lived in a rural area than an urban area. So with redistricting, we equalize populations to account for that. And who redistricts? And this is really the central point of my discussion and, and large, largely what you'll be hearing from today. In the rest of the world, redistricting is done by nonpartisan staff, the rest of the democratic world, or it's done by a commission. The United States is pretty much the last, one of the very last remaining democracies where we have the peculiar approach of allowing incumbents to draw their own districts. So the state legislature draws state legislative districts, and they also draw congressional districts. Now, you may be immediately thinking, that's a little bit odd. The people who get elected get to then draw the districts that they get elected in. Uh, if you think that's a little bit odd, you're right. It is a conflict of interest. You have people who have the power to determine who's voting for them to then get elected in it. So it's kind of the people, the elected officials choosing their voters for their voters have an opportunity to choose them. And so to understand a little bit on what can happen when you have that, oh, some of that script bounced over. Uh, when, the political pro when the redistricting process gets abused, uh, it's a process called gerrymandering. So that's when lines are drawn to accomplish a political goal. And that can often be to disenfranchise a political party, uh, but it can also be done for more personal reasons to help an incumbent hurt a challenger for other reasons. Gerrymandering is not new. Gerrymandering goes back to when districts existed. So even the name gerrymandering, for example, goes back to Massachusetts in the 1800s where you had a governor, Eldridge Gary, who drew lines to disenfranchise the Federalist Party and the local press thought those lines looked like a salamander. So it was called Governor uh, Gary's Salamander, which became gerrymander, gerrymandering. So that's where our term gerrymandering itself came from. But of course today with powerful computers, the ability to gerrymander is much more sophisticated, much more powerful than it has ever been before. 
So let's take a quick look at what that means. North Carolina for right now is a, an example of a state whose lines are being litigated at the Supreme Court because of a really extreme version of partisan gerrymandering. So the Republican-controlled legislature drew what you can kind of tell here on the map, pretty extremely contorted districts. And they drew it for the purpose of essentially disenfranchising Democrats and maximize Republican gains. So in 2018, just this past election cycle, Republicans and Democrats were about in a dead heat. Each side got about 50% of the vote. But when you look at the congressional delegation, the Republicans won about 80% of the seats. So 50% of the votes, but 80% of the representation. And that's because they drew the districts in a certain way to give themselves a supermajority advantage. And we know this wasn't just random chance because they actually declared on the record this is what they're trying to do. So here's a great quote, and this is again said on the record. I propose that we draw the maps to give a partisan advantage to 10 Republicans and three Democrats because I do not believe it is possible to draw a map with 11 Republicans and two Democrats. So the reason why it was drawn this way is because we couldn't make it even more advantageous to Republicans. There's just no way to do it. Gerrymandering, though, is not just something that affects one-off states. It's really something with national implications. When you have elections, you, of course, hope if one party gets more votes, they should see more seats in office. But when you have gerrymandering, you can sever that political accountability that uh, elections are supposed to have. You can make it so that election results do not match how people are voting. So in this past election in Congress, we, of course, heard that there was a blue wave. Democrats uh, had huge increase, one of the most highest increase in, in voting percentages for a party, I think in like a generation or so. But what's interesting is their gains were almost entirely, 75% almost, uh, in states where the lines were not drawn by the legislature but were drawn by courts or by a commission. And so the New York Times actually ran a headline that said, what's more powerful than the blue wave? Gerrymandered districts. Because in states where the districts had been gerrymandered, drawn by the state legislature, you barely saw an increase. Uh, in terms of representation, even though the vote increased there to similar degrees that it had in other states. So I want to shift now. That's kind of an overview of gerrymandering. Let's talk about California. How did we get to our commission, and what were some of the impacts that really led us down this path? California has its own history of gerrymandering, and I like to start in the 1980s, though it actually dates back further than that. If you talk about the 1980s, you had a Democratic legislature and a Democratic governor, and they drew the lines to really maximize Democratic gains. Uh, so one example of this was with a congressional delegation. Before redistricting, Democrats and Republicans were about even in terms of the size of the congressional delegation. But after drawing uh, pretty strongly Democratically leaning districts, uh, suddenly their advantage jumped to adding 10 additional seats after redistricting. And in fact, this too was not an, an area where people were trying to be modest or hiding. The Democratic Assembly member who's in charge was a guy named Phil Burton, who said that the districts were his contribution to modern art, which was how kind of contorted the districts were to accomplish this result. Fast forward to the 1990s and something interesting happened. You had a Republican governor in a Democratic legislature. What that meant though is they couldn't agree on a plan. They deadlocked, no maps could get passed. So got booted to the courts. So the courts redrew the maps. And because the courts didn't have self-interest in how the lines were drawn, 1990s are largely seen as one of the fairest redistrictings that California has had. And what you actually saw in that process is competition came back. Elections and how people were voting really mattered. So for a brief period of time, for example, the state assembly actually changed party hands twice in that decade because the election districts were much more responsive to how the voters were voting. And then we get to the 2000s, which is uh, the final spark that led to the creation of our commission. In the 2000s, you had what's called a bipartisan gerrymander. What that means is the Democrats could have tried to draw the lines to maximize Democratic gains, but instead what the incumbents wanted is they wanted to be safe. They wanted no competition. They wanted to ensure that there was no chance that they would lose, so they made super Republican Republican districts and super Democratic Democratic districts. So what this essentially was was all the incumbents agreeing Let's just not actually have a competitive election for the next decade. And it worked. It worked extremely well. <laughs> so if you look at the congressional races in that decade, 255 elections for Congress, only one seat changed hands out of 255 elections. Arnold Schwarzenegger, had a, who ended up being a big proponent of redistricting forum, had a great quip where he said, there was more turnover in the Habsburg monarchy than there was in our elections during this time. 
So to give you an example, though, of how incumbency protection not only just affects how our democracy is, is proposed, it also has impacts on the ground. So here's a, a cutout of one of those maps from the Long Beach area. And I want to point out just a few quick things to show how this also has, oh, how this also has impacts on how democracy is experienced. Here you've got a strange little finger jutting out from the, the district. What happened is the incumbent lived right here. So she needed that little finger to keep her inside her district. Another interesting anecdote for, from this district is you had one incumbent living here in Compton, but he had a ranch with horses down here and he wanted the horses to be in his district. So the, the district was caused to snake across so that his horses could be in the same district as, uh, as his house. The consequence of this though is that the city of Long Beach was split into four different districts. And what happens when cities or when communities are split is it reduces their voting power and their influence because proportionally you become a much smaller share of any elected official's uh, vote that he needs. And what that does by diluting your vote, you dilute your influence, you weaken accountability to organic communities as well as cities and jurisdictions. So there are real consequences to this type of splitting. So all this led to uh, Proposition 11. So in 2008, Common Cause, uh, along with California Forward, uh, League of Women Voters, AARP, and later additional groups, got together and put together a ballot reform to create California's Independent Redistricting Commission that we have now. The central guiding principle of the Independent Commission, and this is in the findings of Proposition 11, was that it is, quote, that, quote, allowing politicians to draw their own districts is a serious conflict of interest that harms voters. The whole idea of the commission was to try and take people who have no interest in how the lines are drawn, people who are vetted to not be extreme partisans, people who are everyday Californians who come from different parts of the state, have them look, study what the map should look like, and with that fair eye, be able to come together and draw the maps. So some of the key elements of the commission, uh, open application process to any Californian, there are a lot of strict criteria for who's eligible, but primarily designed to take uh, typical political operatives out of the equation from serving on the commission. So if you've been a candidate for office, for example, or if you're a major donor, you can't serve on the commission. It's also structured to be bipartisan. You have five Democrats, five Republicans, and four others. And to adopt a map, you need a majority vote of each of those three subpools. What that does is no party can steamroll the other side. Other key elements are multiple hearings. Uh, you'll probably hear from the commissioner how many they had, but it was several dozen hearings up and down the state. And there have actually been studies on how much the commission uh, tried to accommodate uh, local perspectives on what their communities were. And it was a pretty high degree of, of people who proposed actual mappable comments. The commission actually adjusted their lines to reflect it. So this is really something where seeing a commission that doesn't have a vested interest and brings in public participation that's meaningful and actually counts for something. Finally, it had very strong and clear criteria to guide the commission and how it should draw its lines. Things like trying to keep cities together, trying to keep communities together. And that's a really important check against gerrymandering and also it gives everyone a common uh, goal to strive for as they create these districts. So there's a, a lengthy application process you'll hear about. Not lengthy for the applicants, but lengthy in terms of how the vetting is done. But you're going to hear more from that from the other panelists. I'll skip over that. I'll go straight to the results so that you're going to hear even more from one of the other panelists. But essentially what, what academics and scholars have, have found is that the commission did do a much better job than the legislature in terms of partisan fairness, in terms of not drawing lines to try and entrench incumbents. The commission did a far better job in terms of really objectively measurable things like not splitting communities, not splitting cities. The commission also did a better job than the legislature had done. In fact, if you see this little award down here, the commission was uh, recently awarded an innovation award from Harvard's Kennedy School for really being uh, a national model and to most reformers really the gold standard for how redistricting should be done. What's been really particularly inspiring to see is with the success of California State Commission, you've also seen this reform start to percolate in other places and that the popularity and kind of the, the philosophy of independent redistricting has also really taken root. So when Proposition 11 was first passed, it barely squeaked by, about 51% of the vote. But what's interesting is there were multiple attempts to either repeal the commission or expand its authority. And with each vote, the public's uh, affection for and belief in independent redistricting grew stronger. So repeal the commission, 60% against, and in fact 60% voted to increase its mandate. 
an attempt to undo its maps was rejected by 70%. And then there's even a, PPA, uh, a field poll asking how people approved of the commission that had 75% approval rate. So the more people got to know and get familiar with the commission, its popularity grew. One area that I'm particularly interested in too is to see this commission model really expand at the local level. I'm not gonna go too much into this because my presentation is mostly on the state, but I do a lot of work on local redistricting where we have a lot of scandals and problems as well. And so before the state commission, you only had two local redistricting commissions. After you had 14, we now have LA County, San Diego County, uh, City of Oakland, City of Sacramento, Long Beach. There are actually more local commissions. If you added up all their population, it's bigger than all but five states. So not only have we succeeded at the state level, but this is really a philosophy that is being extremely adopted at the local level. And there's even a bill right now in the state legislature to require large counties to have to have independent commissions. And finally, the state commission is really percolated across on the national level too. Uh, you now have nine citizens commissions in the state. There were four ballot measures just this past year to try and either create commissions or strengthen the redistricting process. So this is a movement that is, is growing nationally and with a tight deadline since redistricting is right around the corner. So with that, uh, I'll kind of just conclude by saying the, the reason that California's commission was so successful was in part obviously its structure and its process, but it also owed to the fact that we had excellent commissioners. And for the commission to be successful going into 2020, we need that again. So we need good people to apply and good people to be appointed to the commission. So if you're interested in redistricting, and truly this is one of the most, I think, fulfilling public services you could really think of. You're determining for the next decade what representation will look like and that it'd be fair in California. So if you're personally interested, I'd urge you to apply to the commission if you're part of an organization. Uh, consider having your organization also help to find applicants or encourage people to apply because it's a wonderful and very important thing to do. So with that, thank you very much and I'll pass it on to the next speaker. Thank you, Nick. Um, you know, that noise that happened earlier made me think of, I, when I came in here, I set my bag down, and that noise happened just at the moment that I set my bag down. And it made me think of that. Have you ever seen that, the, the third Indiana Jones movie where, where there's the guy in the library who's like, punk, and every time he slams down his stamp, the Indiana Jones like, you know, takes this uh, big piece of metal and pounds on the floor, and so he, the guy thinks that it's his stamp that's making the noise. Anyway, just reminded me of that scene. Um, so uh, I want to talk a little bit about what came out of the commission. Um, so Nick talked a little bit about um, so the structure of the commission and, and, and uh, where it came from. This is kind of what it did. Uh, so the, um, as was just mentioned, the, uh, the, the districts that the um, Citizens Redistricting Commission had to draw, there was, there was a list of criteria that they had to follow when they were drawing their districts. And it was actually a ranked list, um, so that if criteria conflicted with each other, they would have to go with the, the item that was higher ranked on the list. Um, and those items were equal population, which actually is something mandated by the courts, so whether they had put that into the law or not, it would have been something required um, for the commission to do. Uh, they had to comply with the Voting Rights Act. Again, that's federally mandated, so it would have been something that was required, but it was something they put explicitly into the law because they wanted to, to make sure that uh, minority rights advocates um, you know, could, could feel uh, assuaged on that point and not be concerned about what might come out of this commission. Um, so there was actually a number of items that had to do with making the districts that the commission drew be um, respectful of traditional geographic criteria. So um, they had to be contiguous, meaning they had to touch at all points. Um, they had to be uh, compact, as, as compact as possible, meaning as close to sort of circles and squares and sort of traditional shapes as possible. Um, and respectful of, of communities with common interests, the sort of communities of interest is the, is the term of art in redistricting. They were also supposed to, for when you're talking about the legislature, there's twice as many assembly districts as there are Senate districts, and they were required to the extent possible to have what they call nesting, that is the, uh, the, the um, assembly districts, two assembly districts should to the extent possible 
be uh, embedded within a single larger Senate district. Um, and now, again, this was lower, a lower ranked criterion, so um, if it conflicted with other things higher up, and as you see, it, it, it did at one point, um, then they had to go with those higher items, but it was certainly on the list. And then they required you know, no favoring parties um, or, uh, or incumbents. It's sort of a negative or criterion. Uh, in addition to these things that were listed, um, I think it's fair to say that uh, there were some partisan outcomes that were hoped for, but were not express, uh, expressly put into the law. And one of them is that they were that the the plans were fair to the major parties. So regardless of whether the commission took into consideration partisan uh, advantage or partisan interests, um, that that the the plans that came out of the commission would be relatively balanced. Um, so by, by fair in the sense, we mean no large gaps between um, the share of votes that a, that a party would receive and the share of seats that that party would get from, for that vote share. Uh, and I think people were hoping that there would be a number of competitive races because one of the things, as Nick talked about, was that the, the existing plans were extremely uncompetitive. Um, not much turnover happened, and so people were hoping, hey, can we get some more districts that are that are, could flip one way or the other. So by that, I'm in, this, in what I'm going to show you, I mean districts that kind of fall in this sort of maybe 45 to 55 percent range um, in terms of their, their vote outcome. So uh, got all this long list of things. How did they do? I did an, done a bunch of analysis over the course of the last um, almost 10 years looking at what came out of the commission. And uh, I want to go through it um, in these uh, pieces in terms of the first the, the, um, the, the uh, voting rights. Uh, so uh, to get it out of the way, the, the equal population requirement is, is, is a so strict a requirement and is so consistent across states that, that it's not even really worth looking at whether they made the districts equal in population. It's a really important thing that every districting does is to equalize the population across districts. But it, it just sort of goes without saying that um, if they passed the plan, it, it had to meet that criterion. So we're kind of looking more for other things that other on that list that, that they accomplished. And the first is whether they um, uh, both respected the Voting Rights Act and, and actually actively improved minority representation. Uh, and the answer is yes. So this is just showing you um, the, the number of districts that had, just one metric, the number of districts that had um, a majority minority population. And you know, minority is a little bit of a squishy term for California now because there's actually more Latinos than, than um, non-Hispanic whites. Uh, but, um, but nonetheless, we'll just as, uh, uh, use it as, as shorthand. Um, and you can see that the number of Latino districts actually increased um, quite a bit. Uh, this is across all three plans, the Senate plan, the Assembly plan, and the Congressional plan. You can see that the, the number increased quite a bit, and there are actually not, not much change for African Americans, but, but considerable change for Latinos, and a, uh, um, uh, the first Asian American uh, Assembly district, district of any kind in California history. Um, did it uh, split cities? So one of the things was try to avoid splitting cities between multiple districts. Um, so this here is the share of, of all cities. And, and when we did this analysis, we looked just at cities that were, um, that were uh, small enough to be contained within a single district. So there's a lot of cities, obviously, that have to be split. So we, we set those aside um, because the number of such cities um, that that can fit within a single district actually has changed over time in, uh, in an appreciable way. So, uh, so looking at just the ones that could be could be embedded, um, we see actually some improvement. So we, we want the, the n these numbers to go down if the commission is doing a good job, um, and the, for the assembly it does go down. It's pretty flat for the Senate, and actually for Congress it went up just a little bit. So I think the overall story here is that there isn't actually um, tremendous change in terms of the number of cities that are split, but, but uh, on balance it's probably a little bit down. You get a similar story for, for counties. Um, here this is just the raw count of counties that were split. 
um, and you can see that uh, actually there's quite a, quite a big drop for the Senate, um, but not as much change for Assembly and Congress. Probably the best conclusion to come out is that um, there was maybe a modest decrease in the number of splits, but not a significant change. And, and that's just because the reality is the number of cities and counties that were split in the old plan, despite the fact that there were a lot of really um, ugly shaped districts, was not all that high. It just, you, you, you didn't split that many in the first place, and then the reality is that you have to draw some for, for the, the criteria that are higher up on the list. You have to draw at least a few districts that, that are not boxes and, and nice, um, nice looking shapes. So getting into that point, which is how compact are these districts? Are they, again, are they sort of shaped like um, squares and circles and, and boxes? Um, uh, or are they kind of all over the place and squiggly? Do they look like salamanders, right? Um, and there were a number of very strangely shaped districts in the old plans. Uh, and this is one of those places where they actually made quite a considerable improvement. Um, so this is one, just one measure of compactness. There's a bunch of different mathematical measures of compactness that are out there. Uh, this one, it goes from zero to one, and the closer you get to one, the more compact it is. So you can see that across the Assembly, the Senate, and the uh, um, Congress, uh, there's, there's an, uh, an improvement. And for a Senate and State Senate and Congress, there's actually a considerable improvement in, in the compactness. And that, that comes from just the eyeball test, too. If you look at these plans, they look a lot more compact. Again, it's not that there aren't some districts that have funny shapes, but people don't live in squares and circles. So if you want um, to respect equal population across districts, and if you want to also respect the Voting Rights Act, you're going to end up with some slightly um, odd shapes, but, but it's considerably better for these plans than before. Actually, one point that I haven't been mentioning as we go along here is I'm showing three different numbers. Um, this is the old plan here. This is the one that they that they initially, the commission initially released in June, I guess it was, July. Anyway, uh, and then the final plan that they adopted in August. And there was actually a lot of feedback that they got at this stage um, that helped them to modify the plans for the final passage, and so there were some changes. And we haven't seen, uh, there was, uh, the biggest change that came was um, that they got pushback on the number of um, minority representation districts that they drew. And, they, and so they made, a much, they made a much stronger point of drawing more of those types of districts and making sure that there was more representation for minority interests in the final plan. Uh, and so, what did that do? The, the, one of the big things that, the big costs of making that change was nesting. So, in the first, so here's, here's the number, this is just telling you, on average, how many assembly districts do you have within a Senate district? The higher this number, the less nesting you have. It should be, if, it's, if it were perfect nesting, you had two assembly districts within every Senate district, that number would be two. And uh, in the old plan, you see it's not even close to two. It's well over six. Um, so the, the just kind of the, the Senate and the Assembly plans crisscrossed each other all over the place. For the draft plan, um, it actually got remarkably close to perfectly two. So under three, just a little bit under three. And that's amazingly close to, to perfect nesting. Uh, but then they did get that pushback, and um, they adjusted. And one of the things that um, that was sacrificed for better minority representation was that nesting. Um, the uh, and so the final plan was did not was not it was better than the old plan, but was not as good on the new plan. And again, the the thing that's actually to the commission's credit because uh, because the nesting was lower down on the priority list, so they were not supposed to put it as high up as the Voting Rights Act. The final th thing I want to look at here is um, these, this question of, of partisan outcomes, both the partisan fairness and the competitiveness of the plans. So this here is, um, for the assembly, 
uh, this measure of um, partisan fairness that I developed called the efficiency gap. And it's, if it's zero, it's uh, by the efficiency gap, a zero is a fair plan. Um, and what you can see is that over time, so that you've got the, the sort of bluish line is the rest of the United States for, a, for lower chambers in the rest of the United States. And then the orange line is California. And both before and after the redistricting, um, here's where the, the lines were drawn. Before and after, uh, there's a slight tilt toward Democrats, but nothing too significant. And in the rest of the country, it's maybe a little bit of a tilt toward Republicans. But by and large, you don't see a lot of, there's a lot of bouncing around here, and you don't see uh, any sign of a, of a clear and obvious difference between the two. Or, for that matter, a, a significant shift after the redistricting, which is another thing you might look for. Uh, and it's worth noting that partisan fairness is different from competitiveness because you can actually have a plan where one party isn't wildly out of whack in terms of the, the seat share it gets for the vote share it receives, but there's no competitive districts, right? And you could have the reverse, too. You could have a lot of competitive districts, but one party is getting, you know, 80% of the, uh, the seats for 55% of the vote or something, right? So they are different concepts. Um, and that's why even under the old plan, you saw a kind of reasonable partisan fairness. Uh, and that's because the old plan was a bipartisan gerrymander. It wasn't meant really to favor one party or the other. It was meant to prevent seats from changing hands. So the Senate, you can see it, it shifts around a lot more. That's largely because the Senate has fewer seats that are up each time. So um, in the nation as a whole, again, it tilts maybe a little Republican. Here it's kind of bouncing all over the place, but maybe tilts a little bit Democratic, but no clear shift um, across that redistricting line. And then the same thing is true for, for Congress. Um, this sort of a one outlier year in each decade, but, but no clear trend. Um, actually, what you see in, for Congress is, if anything, uh, after redistricting in the rest of the country, the plans became considerably more Republican. This is just looking at the share of seats that fall between that 45 and 55 percent range. So this is just one possible measure of competitive that you could use. Just saying, is it close to that threshold where it could tip? Um, and uh, here you see that there is actually, so in 2008 there were a number of competitive races. Not, not many seats actually flipped, but there were a number of competitive outcomes. Um, but otherwise, in the old plan, the districts were pretty uncompetitive. So there were just not that many that fell within that, that range. Um, consistently been a little bit higher for the, for the assembly after the, uh, under the new plan. Um, same basic pattern here for the Senate. Um, there's been this, there's this one year in 2008, it was much higher, and then a little bit um, more competition for the Senate as well. And um, so I think for both the Assembly and the Senate, we can say the competition is a little bit higher, um, not dramatically higher, but a little bit higher. But for Congress, it's much more of a noticeable change. Um, the, and, and really, out of the three plans, Assembly, Senate, and Congress, the Congress plan, the Congressional plan, was, was just epically uncompetitive. I mean, you, can, you can't even, like, if you look at, at that old plan, it was just kind of amazing how perfectly they separated it into Republican districts and Democratic districts. Um, just really, it's really wild to look at. So you can see that there just really weren't that many competitive seats. It's been noticeably higher. There's been a lot of turnover in the congressional delegation as a result of these plans. Um, and so that's been a notable change. So overall, um, on the required goals, the things that are actually written into the law, um, the, the CRC produced plans that uh, uh, have more minority representation and are generally more geographically um, uh, we respect uh, traditional geographic criteria um, more explicitly than the old plans did, um, which were all things that they were supposed to do. Uh, on the partisan outcomes, I think they're about 
the new plans are about as fair as the old plans, maybe with a slightly greater democratic tilt than the old plans. Um, and then the new districts are more competitive than the old ones, though I think it's worth noting that, you know, races, the Democrats live in one part of the state, Republicans live in another, so it's actually hard to draw more than a handful of competitive districts, and it's worth keeping in mind that they actually didn't look at partisan um, data when they were drawing their districts, so the competitiveness that comes from, um, from these plans is sort of a happy accident of the process that they followed. And that's it. Thank you very much. I'm actually bringing my notes up here, I'm sorry. <laughs> I have to remember dates. <laughs> so um, we heard from Nicholas about the history of redistricting and from Eric about some of the outcomes of, of the last um, time we went through the redistricting process. And now I'm here to talk about um, how we're going to shape California, uh, the future, because we are now in the process of actually trying to figure out or trying to form a new commission that is going to be actually drawing the new lines. And so someone in this room perhaps, or someone you know, or someone in the room that was here uh, happened to draw the lines last time too. Um, but perhaps there's someone here or someone you know that will actually be um, shaping California's future for the next 10 years as well. And anxious to see what happens in the next time we listen to Eric um, talk about that. So my name's Margarita Fernandez with the California State Auditor's Office. And let me see if I can do this. Um, I have a few things on my agenda and I'm probably going to gloss over a few things because um, Nicholas talked about a few things that I, I had in my, um, in my presentation, so did Eric. And um, I mean, the great thing is that we're all talking about redistricting. And 15 years ago, not many of us were talking about redistricting. So this is really exciting. Um, last time when uh, we went through this process, we had to go through initially to educate people about what redistricting was, and mostly because um, many of us didn't know much about it because it was kept in um, out of the public. Um, the legislature did it behind closed doors. We didn't really know what was going on. So we already know what redistricting is, what, um, what its importance is, and how California changed the re whole redistricting process. So now the independent 14-member uh, commission is actually the, the um, entity that's charged with redrawing the district lines every 10 years after the census is taken. And, um, you know, they'll be drawing four maps, uh, the State Senate, the State Assembly, the State Board of Equalization, and also the congressional um, districts. And what also happens is that we do have a commission right now, the uh, 2010 commission, and, and Stan is here with us, uh, Commissioner Stan. Um, but um, it's actually a brand new commission that will be drawing the new lines. So every 10 years we'll go through this process. And so that's probably why you want to apply now, because if you don't apply this time and you don't get on the commission, you're going to have to wait another 10 years before you get to apply again. So. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about our role. Um, the California State Auditor's Office, I know somebody was um, grimacing about the auditor uh, being in the room. We, I just want to clarify, we do not audit anyone's taxes, so we won't be looking at anything here. Um, actually, our office is an independent entity. We're nonpartisan, and we're not free of legislative and executive branch uh, control. Um, we do perform, uh, conduct uh, audits, financial audits as an external auditor uh, for the state of California, but we also conduct performance audits, um, operational audits of um, state agencies, uh, local governments. Um, we, we have uh, authority really to go into just about any publicly created entity. Um, but we conduct our work um, in, in accordance with standards, and I, I believe that's probably why our office was, was written in the initiative as, as the entity that will be charged with selecting the new commission every, team, every 10 years. And it's because of a nonpartisan office and uh, being a trusted voice for uh, California. So our role is um, 
conducting outreach, which is one of the things I'm trying to do right here, <laughs> right now. Um, and the first time we went uh, through the process, we also had to draft regulations with all the, the um, with what was approved in the initiative. In fact, uh, Stan and I were just talking a little bit ago. Um, we, when we conducted our, uh, or, or wrote our regulations, we went up and down the state to discuss the, what the proposal wa was. We listened to uh, various organizations who came to provide public input and so that we could craft those regulations in a fair and also nonpartisan way as well. This time we just had to update, revise a few th minor things, but we didn't have to do a whole lot because not much had changed with the law. Um, we do are have required to uh, conduct the application and, and the whole selection process for, the, for selecting the commissioners. And then also, um, now there is one change that happened in between um, 2010 and now is that the Secretary of State initially was responsible for assisting the commission in establishing and um, having some support before they, they embarked on their own. And now our office is charged with that. So we'll be responsible for assisting the commission when they're formed, uh, helping them get started, making sure they have pens and pencils. I understand they didn't have that last time, but I promise we'll, we'll make sure they do have that. Um, but, the int but the commission, um, when it's fully formed and fully functional, functional, will be its own entity and will operate independently um, and will conduct their work as they see um, in, in accordance with the, what's required, but as they see fit. Um, so the role and, and who they are, um, as, as Nicholas mentioned, right now um, the law is that the 14-member commission, uh, five members will be from the largest California party, which right now is the Democrats, um, and five from the second largest uh, California party, which right now is the Republicans, and then four who, uh, uh, have no party preference or belong to a different party. A again, they're responsible for drawing the four maps that we talked about. And the commission needs to be formed by August 2020. So you're probably thinking, why are we starting now already? It it's kind of a an extensive process. Um, I think I might have skipped one. It's kind of an extensive process, and I'll explain a little bit more about that. Now, the role of the commission, as um, Eric talked about, they had different uh, criteria. They have to hold public meetings, they have to listen to community uh, input, and they have to follow criteria when they're drawing the lines. I won't go into any of those because uh, that's something you've already heard about, but it's mostly so that you know that they have to go through a process. They can't go out there and just start do, uh, doing whatever they want to. Um, so they do have criteria and they have to follow that. One of the things that we will be doing uh, for the commissioners is that um, we, we know that they're going to need attorney almost right off the bat. So before the commission is uh, selected, we will be already soliciting, uh, be solici soliciting applications for an attorney. We won't select them, but when the commissioners are for when the commission is formed, we'll be able to hand them the application so that they can review them and select them on their own. Um, so this is, the, this is where we start selling the, the commission. If you haven't been sold already, because you know that there were really positive ac outcomes, there's um, great opportunity for civic engagement, and ju just something, like I said, that happens once, once a decade. Um, so to be a commissioner, you have to have uh, voted uh, in at least two of the last uh, statewide general elections. You also have to be, have been continuously affiliated with your party, um, or uh, if you didn't have a party preference, that same affiliation as well uh, for the previous five years. And then the, the conflicts of interest that were created mostly to keep the politics out of it, as Nicholas uh, talked about. So, uh, for example, some of the conflicts of interest include if, if you uh, work for or were appointed to or, um, yeah, or, or, or work with under contract with a state elected official or a congressional elected official, then you can't, you're not eligible to apply. Equally, if, if one of your um, a bona fide family member works for or, or um, contracts with, um, they're not, you're not eligible to apply. Again, these are intended to keep the politics out of it and to ensure that, that the commission 
is really just focused on, on doing what's good for California and creating fairer and equal dis uh, districts as well. So, the other criteria um, as far as who should be applying, um, we're the, the, and this was specifically in the um, proposition when it was passed as well, is that we're looking for people who have uh, strong analytical skills, who have the ability to be impartial, and who have an appreciation for California's diversity demographically and, geog and ge with the geography as well. I mean, and that was uh, in part because uh, the commission should be, um, sh should, be uh, should be formed with citizens from throughout the California that really, and they should be reflective of California, and that was the intent of, of the authors for the um, initiative. So I'm hope, we're hoping that you're very interested in the process. I think um, there was a selection, application selection process information sheet in the back. Um, but the first thing is, so if you're interested, or even if you know people who are interested, or if you want to spread the word about it, um, Shape California's Future is our campaign. And um, you want to go to our website right now and sign up um, so that you can receive email notifications. It'll be at that site, that website, where we uh, initiate or launch our online application process. There's on the back of the postcards as well. Yes, thank you. Um, the application process is going to start really soon, um, just a few weeks away. Actually, is it 12 working days away? I can't remember exactly. I think we were counting down. <laughs> so um, it's a two-step process, uh, two-step application process. Uh, the first one is, a, is a fairly easy to complete, and uh, there's a 60-day window for uh, people to apply. And it's basically to self-report, um, see if you meet those, the, the minimum eligibility requirements. Um, but you need to go through that phase first to then be able to continue in the process, which is the supplement, supplemental application process. Now that one's a little bit more extensive. Um, and we will be actually providing a copy of the application for the supplemental part um, 30 days before the, that application period starts, which will be in, in August. And, um, that one is a little more extensive. A lot of people have, com have said the last time how um, complex it was. And um, it, I'm not sure if it was so complex, but the whole process of redistricting is complex. And, um, and it's exciting uh, to be able to be part of, of, of shaping that part of, um, or having an impact on every community in California. So it is a little lengthier. We're trying to get at um, the analytical skills, the ability to be impartial, and the appreciation for California's diversity. Um, and we're also trying to make sure that, um, that those conflicts of interest um, are, if there are any, are identified early, rather than um, once you, you pass on from that process and go into an interview part. Um, so we're, we're trying to make sure we vet all that during that process. And during that time, we'll, we'll be conducting webinars, we'll be going to speak anywhere anyone wants us to speak, conduct a workshop, um, if you need any assistance in, um, in completing that part. It will also require some letters of recommendation. But throughout that process, the application process, it will all be held, uh, it will all be a, a public, transparent process. We'll have everything online so that the public can be involved. We want the public to provide input. If you know someone who's applying um, and you think they'd be a great um, commissioner, let us know. Send us a, a public comment. Um, equally, if you know someone that's on there and you think they may have been dishonest about their eligibility, let us know about that too. Um, what happens next after the supplemental application peri uh, period is over, an applicant review panel will be reviewing all the applications. Now the applicant review panel um, was already appointed, uh, selected in our office actually a couple weeks ago. Um, they had to, the requirements for being on the panel wa was that you had to have, uh, have 10 years of independent audit experience with our office and that one 
of the panelists would be a Democrat, one would be a Re Republican, and one would be neither of, of, of those two parties. And so we, we did, and it was a random drawing similar to what's going to happen at the end um, in um, forming the commission. So if you're interested in knowing who's looking at the applications, we have that information online on uh, Shape California's Future. And uh, so there's a little bit of information of each one of those panelists. So they will be going, they have uh, the task of going through all the supplemental applications the, and all the material and the public comments and identifying um, the most qualified applicants. All the meetings will be public meetings. They will, they will conduct all their business make all their decisions in a public setting. So we'll, we'll live stream all the meetings. We'll post uh, the agenda and any information they'll be looking at 10 days ahead of, of the meeting. We'll also um, pass on any public comments that we receive on any of the applicants that they will be reviewing. Um, we'll have a cutoff date, of course, because they, they have to have time to, to look at it, but we'll post that information online as well. So initially what they'll be doing is they'll be identifying 120 of the most um, qualified applicants. And it'll be 40 from each of the, su the three sub pools. And um, when they identify, when they get to that point, they will um, be calling them in for an interview. The interviews are, are also public um, as well. They will be live streamed as well. Um, and then ultimately identifying uh, 60, in e or 60 of the most qualified applicants. Um, 20 from each of the sub polls, again, live stream. So we're not quite done. <laughs> we won't be quite done. Um, there is one part where the legislature does have a role in this uh, selection process. And um, the legislature, when we identify, when the panel identifies the 60 of the most qualified, we will provide that information to the legislature. The four legislative leaders have an opportunity to strike some names. And if they exercise all their strikes, which is two each, they will return to us the names of those, candidate, those applicants that are still in the pool. So there would be at least 12 uh, of the most qualified in each of those sub pools. And then at that point, um, the state auditor will uh, conduct a random drawing and will randomly draw the names of the first eight commissioners, three Democrats, three the Republicans, and two that belong to neither of those two parties. And then the, once those first eight commissioners are selected, uh, those commissioners will then six, uh, sel select the remaining six, and they're supposed to um, consider the diversity of the the commission um, in making that final selection. I think I probably skipped ahead. So right now we are, like I said, conducting our outreach. We were trying to raise awareness, as much awareness of the opportunity to apply ahead of time. Again, that we will begin uh, June 10th will be our launch. We plan on ho hosting a few uh, press events um, in different parts of California and I know some of our um, some of our other outreach partners are are also uh, going to have some events to really raise awareness and try to get the word out about the the uh, opportunity to apply. One of the things we learned uh, last time is that it is incredibly important to have community-based organizations um, and nonprofit organizations help us spread the word. Um, I know that many of you in this room, many that, be, that participate in many of these community organizations know uh, many people and um, have a, a great network. And you are a big part of helping us spread the word and identifying eligible applicants. Um, you know, part of the, the, the difficulty the first time around was, number one, that people didn't know what redistricting was, so they, how can they be interested? And number two was really trying to get people, because uh, people that haven't been involved, to get involved. Because we couldn't have uh, uh, people who had been involved in politics in the past. So we were really trying to get people that were on the sidelines to get into the game. And so groups like this or forums like this is, is what's really going to help us reach those 
people that we know, that every one of us knows, are eligible and would do a great job at um, drawing the lines. So we, we, we've also contacted all the university, well, almost done contacting all the universities, but we contacted quite a few. Um, they're sending information out on our, uh, on behalf, on our behalf through uh, like alumni newsletters. Hopefully some of you have already been getting some of that. Um, the libraries are all on board, every county. Uh, the libraries are on board as far as, number one, they've been posting information about the opportunity to apply, and number two, they have made a commitment to ensure that there's computers available in case people don't have internet service. They can go um, to a library to fill out an application. So um, I am going to close with visit our website, Shape California's Future, um, auditor.ca.gov, sign up to get our email notifications. If you want us to come and speak at any uh, forum or a meeting, let us know, and please help us spread the word. And if you're interested, I am encouraging you to apply as well. Thank you, Nicholas, who was doing that, but I think Stan's going to do an even better job <laughs> that. So I am going to leave it to uh, Stan now. So this is the this is like old times. I get to take the microphone away from Stan. It's it's one thing to listen to folks who are experts and who can tell the the story from an academic perspective and a public policy perspective, and it's kind of another thing to to listen to the reflections of somebody who's who's known to us here. We're very lucky that we have knowledge of one of the people who served in this very illustrious group of the first 14 on this commission. They started with 36,000 applicants in 2010, 2011, when this process went forward. And through all that winnowing uh, that's just been described, they got down to, to 14. And Stan Forbes was one of those 14, one of, one of the eight that was chosen by the lottery. Uh, so he's, he's been able to touch history in something that's a very unique and exciting change that's had an impact not just in California but all across the country and I think even internationally as people start thinking about how to how to best divide and represent and have a really strong democracy. So Stan was a school board member here in Davis, a local business owner, a downtown business owner, a bookstore owner with, with his, his partner. Alzada, who's here as well, so thank you for being here. He's an attorney, an almond grower, uh, and he served on the Davis City Council as well as on the school board from, so from 1996 to 2000, I think Stan was a, was a Davis City Council member. So he, we have this unique opportunity to have one of us speak on, and share his reflections on how that went, what it was all about, uh, what really happened, uh, and and whether it's something that that uh, we ought to we ought I think we all know we ought to continue it. But just Stan, thank you so much for being able to come and share Glad with us. It. And I hope another Davisite gets picked for the next commission. <laughs> well, m most of, much of what I normally say has been said. The history of it and the selection process. And um, but I want to talk a little bit about um, the meaningfulness of it. This, I mean, I'm speaking, in this case, I'm speaking for all my commissioners. There's 14 of us, and I'm the chair right now. Actually, I've been chair for a while. Um, this is a meaningful thing. This matters. In 1962, we were told about how we got the one person, one vote. That was the Baker v. Carr case that came out of Tennessee. One person, one vote. But what it didn't do was give you one person, one meaningful vote because gerrymandering steals your vote. It's just simple as that. And I'll give you an example. In Georgia, and I'll tell you about a lot of states because I've had occasion to travel to a lot of states and make the same kind of presentation. In Georgia, 81% of the districts are uncontested because they're so badly gerrymandered. They've taken the people's right to vote away from them because of the gerrymandering. And that's not at all uncommon. It's true, it's true in Virginia, it was, it's true in North Carolina, it's true in Pennsylvania, it's true in Maryland, it's, it, was, it was true in Michigan, 
And these are places that either I've been or other commissioners have been. The point is, is that, and the public wants to have a meaningful vote. But I will tell you, having been to these East Coast states, there's a lot of venal politicians who just don't want to give up power. They just don't want to do it. In Pennsylvania, there was a wonderful woman there who's leading a charge to have Pennsylvania redone. She, I mean, I wouldn't want to be, on, I want, I'd want to be against her. She had 18,000 volunteers that she recruited. She had gotten, she'd had 400 public meetings. This is as of last year, 400 public meetings. She had gotten 250 local jurisdictions to petition the state legislature to put some kind of a commission in place. Well, it went to the appropriate committee in the state legislature, and they couldn't get a hearing because he said, and it was a he, I'm not interested. And that was just stopped it cold. Um, we are, as Californians, we should be grateful, I mean, incredibly grateful that we have the initiative process because it wouldn't happen in California. When we sat down as, as a commission, the first eight of us, we, had, we got a yellow pad and a pencil. That's all we were given. And everybody within 10 blocks, I was told, which means the legislature, wanted us and expected us to fail. They wanted us to fail so they could take the power back. And they did not expect us to be successful. But we were. I mean, it's really interesting to go to the East Coast and you know, talk to various groups and testify before the legislature. The California Commission are registering rock stars. And the way I could tell that, there's a Schwarzenegger Institute at USC which is promoting reform. And Arnold, Arnold, my friend Arnold, invited us to come down and participate, basically be recognized. And I could tell that we had made the rock star status with him because he wanted to have his picture taken with me. <laughs> Not, and the other five commissioners who went, but, just, but the point is he wanted his picture with us, not us with him. And I and had one of our commissioners go and smoke cigars at his house. And uh, it was quite something. The, um, this is truly an independent commission. And people don't realize how independent it is and the legislature just bristles at it. But the legislature we, has no authority over us. They cannot remove us. They must pay our bills. And we can write legislation that they can't change. They don't have to pass it, but they can't change it. And that's why actually the, the next commission is gonna be appointed in, August, in July, because one of the big problems we had as commissioners was the time of crunch time. The commission was seated December 31st, 2010. We had to have the maps done functionally by the end of July of 2011. We had seven months. We had to create a state agency from scratch. We didn't know how to do that. In fact, I, we are all delighted that the auditor's office is going to take over the process from the beginning because, talk about a lawyer, we had to wait till we were seated and then we put out the RFPs for the lawyers to apply. I mean, and, this, and that's just really hard to create a state agency. And then we did, we had 34 public hearings throughout the state. We had 70 business meetings that also opened the public, but we had 34 specifically to get community information. And that it was such a gratifying thing because, as, as they talked about, it was a bipartisan gerrymander with one ha seat changing hands at the congressional level. Well, we got to go out there and ask people, what do you want? What do you think your, your district should look like? Well, this was being, we had one old gentleman who said, I've been voting for 40 years. This is the first time that the government has ever come and asked me, what do you want? I mean, that's just not the way things are done. And so, some examples of, of how effective they were, or how effective the process was. Uh, let, me, let me just say that we viewed ourselves as nonpartisan. We're five Republicans, five Democrats, four declined to state. But in fact, if you were to talk to us and ask us what our political views were, you would not be able to tell who was Republican and who was a Democrat and who was an independent. It, it was, it, it, we were interchangeable because the people who got picked were basically good government types. Let me talk a little bit about the selection process from my point of view. I just read about this in the Enterprise in 2010. You know, I've, I've been civic, why not? So I applied, simple as that. 
And the first, the first part, the, the process, as I've explained to other states, is that the first part of it was get rid of conflicts of interest because that just cut, kills the process. If people think you're on the take, then it just, you wait, the map you draw, they won't have any confidence in it. And so that, and you also, and part of that, you have to reveal every single thing about your life, about your finances. I had, I had a, at that point, I had a $2,000 loan out to our son, Alex. I had to list that. Every single thing that you did or you, your whole family had done had to be um, ex exposed, if you will. And I think that did discourage some people. I've heard that in the Asian community in Los Angeles, that did, was a deterrent. Because they, they're not used to have, having all their life exposed, their financials exposed. Um, then you go into the process of um, what are your qualifications? What do you know about diversity? Well, that required, we wrote five, four, this is a debate with people, four or five essays, I don't remember which, and I think they were a thousand words long on these various topics. What do you know about California? What about diversity? Why is diversity important? Now remember, there was a, a question I was asked in the interview. What's the importance of diversity? Why does diversity matter in California? And I said, well, I'm quite sure you could find, and even then, I'm older now, but 14 old white guys with beards who could draw, draw perfectly legitimate maps but people wouldn't trust them because we're not, California's not made up of old white men with beards. And so it's, imp it's important that the, the picture of the commission, it's a bumper sticker. And we have to look like California. And as a consequence, when we picked the, pick the uh, final six, we had to balance, the, uh, I, I was, oh, they talked the random selection. The random selection was to use the California lottery machine to pick the first eight. We, we were, our names put on balls and rolled down, and we came out. And uh, so we first was, was a lucky eight, those of us, as opposed to the uh, elect six. But we ended up with a commission that looked like California. We had four, we had two Asians, one Pacific Islander, one South, a South Asian Indian. We had one Native American. We had two African Americans. We had four Latinos, and we had three Anglos. We had the original commission had, oh, had eight men, six women. We had seven from Southern California. Seven from Northern California. We also had income diversity, and that was intentional. We, we went from a minimum of 35,000 to a lot more, <laughs> a lot more. Um, but, the, but the five of us owned businesses. A couple of us, were, there's one law professor. There was a guy who ran the US Census twice under Clinton and Bush. Um, we had a guy who was the chief research engineer for Raytheon. The cruise missiles, you know, they go fly in your window. He did, he, did, he did the electronics in those. Um, we have a woman, one woman who's in San Francisco, Cynthia Dye. At the time she got the job, she, she has her PhD from Stanford in, in electrical engineering. She was teaching a class in, in teaching engineering at Berkeley and was flying to Beijing to teach at the University of Beijing. She was, had a, a, two jobs, she fly across the Pacific. So it was quite a group and I'm sort of, I still am sort of going, why in the hell did they pick me? <laughs> but, but I was the only farmer. So maybe that, that was my, and I was the only bookseller, so maybe that was the case. And anyway, so that was, that was the selection process. Um, let's see, what do I got here that I had, because Nick, I said, get, told a lot of my stories. Um, let's see. Uh, back, to, back to the process. It was very satisfying because the hearings, everybody got two minutes because we had 23 2,700 people come to the microphone and talk to us. We had 23,000 electronic communications. We all read them all, sorted them out, and we learned a lot about the state of California that we would never have known, and anybody drawing the lines absent these public input would never have known it. That was the second thing, conflict of interest, but also it was vitally important that the public be engaged. They had a chance to come and tell us what did they think their district should look like. A couple of examples. The, the former districts, the 2000 districts, went east-west in the San Joaquin Valley. So the foothills were, were, were subsumed pretty much by districts in, out, of, out of the San Joaquin Valley. They came to us and they said, please draw us a foothill district because our issues are not their issues. They're caring about water supply, chemicals, so forth and so on, transportation. We care about recreation, forest fires, watershed. Those are our issues. And so we went, aha. Uh -huh. We can do that, and we did. Um, 
There was another one which we, 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 we chuckle about. I mean, everybody knows the Napa, Napa and Sonoma wine industry. I mean, this is easy, easy district to draw, so we drew one. Well, they came to us, oh no, oh no. Great district, except the warehousing of our wines is an integral part to our industry. So therefore, put the, wine, put the warehouses in, in the district. And we went, aha. And so we did. We would never have known that. Um, there's a couple, another one which was a more environmental one, and talked about Long Beach being broken up into four districts. We went down to Long Beach, for, and we had people, 710 is a freeway that goes out of the port of Long Beach. Terrible air pollution as a consequence of all the diesel trucks. But the people who live there never had a representative. And they came to us and said, draw us together in a district so we can have a representative that we can go and we can say, can you do something about the air pollution that these trucks are causing? We would never have been able to know that kind of stuff. So it's incredibly satisfying to have, I mean, it's small d democracy in the world's best way of doing it. Um, again, I just think, it has there ever, ever, ever been a legislative bill that's gotten that much participation? And when we actually were drawing the lines, the lines were drawn in public. We spent a month at McGeorge Law School drawing maps. And we would draw a map, and they could make real-time public, everything was online, translated to seven languages, live streamed. We could have no private meetings of any kind. I'll tell you a story about Lois Wolk in a minute. Um, the, um, they said they could call us on the phone. I mean, not they sent these emails and calls on the phone. They sent us emails saying, would you consider doing this? And we'd talk about it as a group in the public, in public eye, and we'd move the line or not, as the case may be. Um, as I said, everybody got, two, got their two minutes of fame at a, at a microphone. Well, we had a very <laughs> difficult issue in Los Angeles, and it's just hard. The Voting Rights Act was written for a black, white world that was the South. But that's not California. We have Asians, we have Latinos, we have African Americans, we have Anglos, we have Jews, we have gays, we have a whole variety of groups we have to try and take into account and see that they don't get split up and that they get represented. So if we, if we really had wanted to follow the Voting Rights Act, we could have reduced the African American representation by one at every level. However, Maxine Waters came to us in her two minutes and she said, don't do that. We have coalition districts here. We can elect three African Americans as our people of our, our representatives of our choice. Just don't cut, us, cut, cut our political power. And one of our commissioners said, you know, I didn't get on this commission to reduce, using the Voting Rights Act to reduce African American political power. That was not my goal. And so we were able, able to keep the districts. So there, you have lots of stories like that. Then, I mean, as I say, we are rock stars. Went back, I went back to Harvard in May of 2017 for a competition for the most creative, innovative, political thing that had happened in the United States. And there are 500 applicants, and 11 of us went back as finalists, and we won. We won $100,000 to go proselytize. So, <laughs> it's, I mean, for, the, for the commissioners, it's been enormously exciting. Um, ten of us have been able to participate. We always, send, we always send a team of three because, again, we are not partisan. We rotated our chair each, of each meeting so, so it wouldn't give the impression that we were um, favoring one party or, over another. We, we did not look where they come as live. We did not look at registration. We, you know, our goal was, it was not to make it competitive. That was not a goal. And the reason we, we opposed making it competitive because once you make it competitive, you're picking winners and losers. And the commission was not going to do that. That was not our job. As I've testified to, uh, to several state legislatures, I, t I say two things. One, these seats don't belong to you. They belong to the public. Well, it's interesting the response you get. There was, I was in Maryland, I guess about a month ago now, testifying in the state senate. And, you know, I would say at least several of the senators were just sort of nodding in agreement, you know, this, these, these are the public seats. I had one guy turn his back to me. So I told you a lot. He didn't think so. The other thing is, and I, I did this in Pennsylvania, my, I started out my presentation saying, we don't care who wins. We just want the public to have a meaningful vote. 
not caring who wins, it was just something that just, just not in their worldview. I mean, that's the only thing that matters is who wins. So I say the public does, you know, the public really doesn't care. The public wants to just have a meaningful vote. So that, and so we've been, well, I've been, I see, I've been to six states, Pennsylvania twice, Virginia twice, just got back from Virginia, North Carolina. Um, and um, well, I say Pennsylvania, I've been to Tennessee. I've, um, um, but it's, oh, it's, it's fascinating to watch the venality. There was an effective voter registration in Tennessee recruiting African-Americans in 2018. The legislature at that point decided it was going to be illegal to do voter registration drives of more than 100 people. That became a law against the law in Tennessee. Or in Pennsylvania, I particularly like this one, there they, would, they refused to, to adjust the lines. So they, they, there was a lawsuit brought into the state Supreme Court under the state constitution. And they ruled in favor of the Democrats, had to be Democrats. This is, this, is, this is a bipartisan activity, however. It depends on who's in the, legisl in the legislature. So the court changed the lines. The legislature at that point sought to impeach the court. That was their response. I don't like what these court did, so I don't care about the Constitution. I want to get rid of these judges. Anyway, I've talked about too, too many stories. You're going to, this is not an easy process. <laughs> I'm sorry, it's not. The first part is, but the, but the qualifications, the essays, were hard because you really want to be careful about them. And you really want to you know, show, show your stuff if you can. Um, and in fact, that was, that's been a complaint we've gotten is that the essays make it too hard. It cuts out a whole bunch of people. If you don't have writing skills, then you're just out of luck. And, but you can expect to work like a slave for seven months which is what we did. I took one day off between January 1st and, and July 31st, one day. I, and that was when I was in Ventura, and we had two me meetings, so I just stayed in Ventura because we had, there was an open day there. It's a lot of work, but there, you will never have a more gratifying experience, and I really do encourage you to apply. I mean, it's, it's, I mean, it's a scary thing, <laughs> and unless you win another grant, the job is largely over when you draw the lines. In fact, we had a lot of trouble with the legislature. Come on, guys, you've got to fund us because they say, why do we have to keep funding you? And we only, try, only get $100,000 a year, which isn't much. Um, it's because, you know, if somebody files a lawsuit against us five years out, which they have the right to do, you can't recreate the agency. I mean, there's other things, and there have been lawsuits along the way. There's sort of, you know, you know, not very important lawsuits, but they've been there, and some they have to defend them. Um, and so, for the most part, the job is largely over, um, except for this, using this grant money. Um, but it is incredibly rewarding. And all of us on the commission think, just are just, you know, it's, it's life changing. It just is. Because you know you have done something that is important, and California is the gold standard. And I could, I could tell you a lot, a lot of reasons why that's the case, but we are the gold standard, and we, we are understood to be the gold standard. Um, Michigan just passed an initiative this last election, and I've got to talk to them next week about how you implement it, um, because they did almost exactly what we did, except our selection process was so, mu so much more complex than they wanted to do. As long as you've been registered and voted, <laughs> they're, they're going to pick them right at random. A random selection, which I think is kind of scary, but that's the way it goes. That's what they're going to do. And it's because our process was so thorough. Anyway, I've talked way too long. Um, that's sort of the, the life story of being a commissioner, and it's just been wonderful. I'm just, just incredibly grateful to have had the opportunity. Thank you, Stan. That was, that was inspiring from all four of you. This is a, we have a few minutes, we're kind of at, the, at our time, but I want to make sure that we have an opportunity to ask questions of this, this group. This is a, an amazing gift that we have to have this, this caliber of speaker with us this evening. And this is timely because the applications for the commission are due June 10th, I believe, from the, from the that's when oh, the open period starts June 10. And it's open for just about two months. So that's right around the corner. So, and this is one of the best ways to get the word out 
This, by the way, is being filmed by Davis, Davis Media Access for later broadcasts, so more people in the community will be able to, to hear about this, uh, this opportunity. Anybody have a, a question that you'd like to raise at this point? Yes, sir. I'd like to ask Eric uh, about the competitive districts and how uh, the jungle primary fits in with that. So the what I was showing was just the outcomes in the general election, so it's not really uh, the easiest answer is they're they're separate concepts. Um, so uh, you could imagine that if the jungle primary, uh, the um, top two primary was producing candidates that were more attractive to both sides, that there might be more competitive races as a result of that. But um, the analysis that I've done suggests that the there, there are more competitive districts, of course, but that it's really a, a function of the redistricting and and, um, and not the top two primary. The top two primary has other has had other effects, um, but but not on that sort of general election competitiveness. So, very good, Norb. Good evening. I really enjoyed the presentation. I started following reapportionment in 1980. I went to work for Assembly Speaker Willie Brown in 82, and we were part of Phil Burton's San Francisco machine at that time. You don't know how happy I am. In 2000, 2001, Kathy Fang from, we call it Stuart Quo's Legal Center down in LA, would fly back and forth to help draw the district because we really wanted to create one Asian American district, either for the state senate, for the state assembly. And when I saw that number one figure, all that hard work over two decades really meant a lot. And I really thank you for the presentation. And it was really worth the commission that made that possible, too, because the, the, the 2001 plan, they explicitly avoided drawing districts like that. I want to give a shout out to Kathy Fung. I've worked with Kathy Fung a lot, and she's a common cause director in California. In fact, I asked her to join me at the Harvard presentation because I was going to say, here's how come we're so wonderful, and this is how, how we're going to be able to spread it around the states. And in fact, as we've gone to the other states, we largely have dealt with common cause. Ah, excellent. I'm very impressed with all the uh, things that have been brought to our attention tonight. And, but there's one thing I'm really worried about. It's the fact that the, all the numbers that we've got here and all the trends and so forth, they're all based on the census. And I'm wondering if the census is going to keep up uh, with you guys. <laughs> um, I, I worked as an in, as an in interviewer in the 2000 census and uh, when you're in the middle of it you realize how much is missed because you're you're right in the middle of it and you can't find these people and uh, there's the census is not as exact as we always hoped it would be i hope there's more improvement and i hope that uh, this f idea of putting the um, question on uh, the uh, people was uh, uh, sense sense the um, yeah the, the putting the question about uh, where what which country you came from is going to add a great deal to the loss of de of exactness of the census. It's just more and more people are not going to answer what their citizenship is. That is a concern for the commissioners. We take the numbers that were given, though. But there is one interesting little twist. Again, it's a California twist. Um, in the last line drawing, people in prisons were counted where the prison was. But the legislature has changed that now. They will be counted at their original address before they went to prison. That's going to have a negative impact on our rural counties because they may have had you know, up in Susanville, may have had 5,000 prisoners, and they're gone. 
and so that's going to affect the rural communities. One of the topics that we're considering for a, a future session like this is, is digging into the census and doing some outreach, You possibly using our Saving California Communities format to get the word out on, on that. So stay tuned if that's of interest. I am seeing some head nods, so maybe that's another topic for us. Uh, yes. I'll, I'll just add that it's a, a very serious concern. And uh, on, the, on the positive side, the state is investing tens of millions of dollars in the budget to try and supplement reaching out to what's called hard to count populations, which are uh, populations that are hard to count, but particularly where like a citizenship question might lead to uh, depressing the, the actual census count. So it's not a per perfect solution, but uh, at least on the positive side, the state is trying to have a very deliberate effort to try and minimize any impacts in that regard. Uh, if you have signed in, if you haven't yet signed in and given us your email address, please consider doing that. Uh, I'm going to ask if our presenters would be willing to let us share your your slides, those who did, with our with the folks who are here and with the other folks who who are on our our email list already, if that'd be all right. So they're nodding their heads yes. Uh, I think we're we're kind of at our time. Uh, Eric, I was just going to make one other comment about the census thing, which is that yeah. PPIC has done some work on. Um, census. I've been part of that too uh, about the census count and the accuracy and so forth. And we have some interactive features on our website about sort of where the hard to count communities are. And we have a report that looks at the potential impact of an undercount, um, uh, partly because of a possibility of a, a citizenship question. So if you're interested in that topic, um, that uh, please go to our website and take a look at those resources. And thank you, Eric. You've you just made a comment. I'd like to offer each of you on the panel a one-minute final closing if you'd like to have anything further to say. I was going to say a point. Like, I have not to do it. Guys, I can't. A microphone. Microphone. <laughs> <laughs> this whole process cost each of you something less than three cents a year. So you, you cost you 25 cents to have your vote matter. And I think that's a pretty good buy. Pretty good buy. And I'll just say, go to shapecaliforniasfuture.auditor.ca.gov and sign up now. And the application period starts June 10. I have nothing to add other than please consider applying. And if you know someone great, encourage them to apply. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. And I thank you, Susan Lovenberg, for putting all of these pieces together for us. And thanks to all of you for being here tonight. Thanks to Davis Media Access for, for uh, recording this for the broader community. And that's a wrap. <laughs>